Thank you very much. That's certainly the most interesting introduction I've ever, I've ever had. <laughs> to wait till I stop laughing. It's really, um, it's just such a, a pleasure to see so many people here to um, think a little bit about science and listen to great music and drink cocktails. I guess the band is gonna be really, really good. So I'm very excited to be here. I want to start with a question. What do you associate with the term civilization? Take a minute and introduce yourself to your neighbors if they're not people you came with and tell, tell each other what, when you hear the term civilization, what, what comes to mind? <clears throat> Any thoughts? <laughs> Is anyone feeling uncivilized, maybe? No, I don't. <laughs> So I'm guessing, I'm, gonna, I'm guessing here in, in Copenhagen at um, Science and Cocktails, we'll probably all feel pretty civilized. Nobody's you know, kind of civilized a lot. In Copenhagen particularly, there's this very rich history of philosophy and um, theology, wonderful buildings and, and architecture, world-class universities, modern architecture, opera and, and culture. And these are all things maybe some of you mentioned to your neighbors when you thought about civilization, not the kinds of pictures that, that pop into your head. But I'm going to argue rather that civilization is just a measure of the state of progress in material science. And I, actually, are there any material scientists in the audience? Okay, good. So I have a few people on my side who do agree with me. Because I'm, I'm going to prove it to you. In fact, you already know it. You just maybe didn't think about it like this before. But from the Stone Age to the Bronze Age to the Iron Age, every major advance in human civilization, so for example, the transition from hunter-gatherer to permanent settlements, from agriculture to crafts and trades, all of these advances in civilization were driven by developments in materials. And this is so much so the case that we call our historical eras after the materials that dominated their times. So there's your proof. Then, uh, <laughs> today, we, we say we're living in the silicon age because silicon is at the core of the microelectronics that enables much of our modern way of life. So, we, of course, we think immediately of computers and mobile phones, but really everything we do is enabled these days by information technologies, communication, transportation, banking, everything, all of con contemporary kind of lifestyle. And over the last decades, we've really enhanced the properties of silicon-based microelectronics to an astonishing extent. I don't know, most of the people in this audience look an awful lot younger than me, but can anybody remember these clunky old desktop computers? Actually, you don't have to admit it if you, if you can, but, but this was the norm when um, I was a youngster. And these days we have smartphones which have infinitely more capability than the old desktop computers, um, astonishing functionality, and they're very small and they're very light and they're relatively inexpensive. But the basic technology behind both of these is, is, is pretty much the same, silicon-based microelectronic devices. And we've really, I, I know certainly I've become quite complacent. Sometimes you think, well, would I buy the, uh, the latest technology or do I wait here and I'll get something that's twice as good, right? It'll, it'll be cheaper and it'll have much more capability. So we've really become um, dependent on, it's not the word, but kind of complacent in, in this idea that Moore's law will keep enhancing our capabilities of our devices um, in, in, indefinitely. But this kind of silicon revolution, it, it can't go on forever. It's going to have to soon come to an end. And the reason is that we start to run into fundamental physical limitations that are set by the size of the individual silicon atoms that make up the material. Once we get down to the size of one atom, we can't go any, any smaller than that, at least not within our existing um, device, device paradigms. And so this steady kind of march of progress to faster, smaller, cheaper devices with more and more capability just can't continue, at least not within the existing kind of framework for, for designing devices. Now you might think that, does that really matter? Certainly, 
I can't see the controls on my smartphone anymore without wearing my reading glasses, and so a smaller smartphone won't help me out. And already we can store more movies than we can watch on a, on a transatlantic plane flight. But it actually poses a really profound problem for society that we can't go on um, improving our microelectronic devices. And the reason for this is that worldwide use of information technologies is expanding so rapidly that by many projections, half of global energy consumption will be taken up by microelectronic devices and information technologies within a couple of decades. And of course, we don't want to deny the rest of the world our standard of living. This is a, it, it's not necessarily, it, it, we can't say it's a bad thing that um, information technologies and microelectronic devices um, is, is spreading globally. As, as we start to adopt more of the Internet of Things, then we have more and more demands on, on microelectronic devices for energy also. And so, but certainly having half of our energy use taken up on microelectronic devices is not a sensible step way, way forward. It's really not sustainable. So we have to move beyond, we have to take a step beyond the silicon age. And since each age is based on a different material, if we want to do this, then we need to have a new material. And so all of us lucky material scientists, in the, in the, those of you in the audience and myself, what we get to do for our job is design that new material. So we have this, um, I guess, privilege and also responsibility of not just designing new materials, but setting the pathway for human civilization into the next age. So let me tell you my story then about the kinds of, oh, oh sorry, here's the data of, um, or projection <laughs> of um, annual energy consumption for information technologies as a function of year. And this is, um, if we d don't do anything different, of course, this is a projection, it's kind of a guess. And one would, of course, really like to hop off this curve and, and move into a situation um, where, say, we're just using only 10% of the world's energy for information technologies. Okay. So let me tell you then my story of, of designing new materials, a little bit of kind of history. So 20 years ago-ish, I was a um, postdoctoral researcher, I just finished my PhD, and I was interested in what are called ferromagnetic materials. So these are materials that contain magnetic dipoles consisting of north and south magnetic poles, like in a bar magnet. And they're all lined up. And these are called, we call these, fer the technical term for these is ferromagnetic materials. And for my postdoctoral um, research, I was working in a group that was expert in what are called ferroelectric materials. So these are materials containing positive and negative electric dipoles that are made up of positive and negative charges. And my plan, my interest, had been to take the theoretical and computational tools and techniques that my host group had developed for studying ferroelectric materials and apply them to the study of ferromagnetic materials. So the fact that both of these names are similar, this ferro in the names, um, reflects a kind of underlying similarity in the behavior of the two materials. So we thought that the methods that had been used for studying ferroelectric materials would be good for studying ferromagnetic materials. So that was the plan. And what I noticed, though, was that the kinds of materials that I was working on were very different from those of my colleagues. So a typical ferromagnetic magnetic material would be something like iron, a black metal. Whereas a typical ferroelectric material is actually a, a transparent ceramic. It looks a bit like a glass. Um, this is actually barium titanate for the experts. It would be a prototypical example. You can see these are very different. They have very different characteristics. And I couldn't find any materials that belong to both of these groups that at the same time were ferromagnetic and ferroelectric. Now, this was before the days when it was easy to go and go do an internet search. One couldn't Google ferromagnetic ferroelectric because it, that, that capability didn't exist at the time. So I went home with, the, um, with a big book on ferroelectric materials, big thick book, and a big encyclopedia on ferromagnetic materials, and spent a weekend kind of looking through both of these books, thinking there's got to be something that's in both books. But there wasn't. There really didn't seem to be any um, magnetic ferroelectrics. And so this question, 
why are there so few magnetic ferroelectrics, really became, a, um, I'd like to say finding the answer to it became a passion for me, maybe people would say it's more like an obsession. Um, when I moved to then and started my own research group at the University of California, Santa Barbara, my focus of my research program really started to center around finding the answer to this question. Why are there so few magnetic ferroelectrics? And after some years, we actually were able to, to figure this out. I want to say that this was a, this, we were not, I was not the first person to have asked this question. There was some, some discussion in the old Russian literature about, about the same thing. There, I'll talk later about why it would be very interesting to have magnetic ferroelectrics. But I got kind of lucky that I came along at the right time with the question. And the tools and techniques of computational material science had developed to a state where we could actually were able to answer the question. And then also the methods of um, making materials had developed to the stage where these materials could be made. So it was kind of, um, the, it was a lucky coincidence that I asked this question at, at just, just the right kind of time in history. And what we discovered was really, it was not rocket science. It was very kind of straight, straightforward. What I found was that the kinds of atoms that are good at making ferromagnetic materials, they're sitting in this kind of part of the periodic table. So iron is the one that we mentioned, that I mentioned earlier. They just have different chemistries than the kinds of atoms that are good at making ferroelectric materials. So they sit in different parts of the periodic table and the arrangement of their electrons is, is, is different. But there was no fund, there's no fundamental reason, there's no kind of basic law of physics why ferromagnetism and ferroelectricity shouldn't be combined. When we started out, we thought maybe there, maybe there was, maybe there was some fundamental reason why these two properties couldn't, couldn't occur together. And so, kind of encouraged by this, um, this discovery that ferromagnetic ferroelectrics should, would be at least in principle possible, then my collaborators and I were able to develop a, a new class of materials, which because they were really were ferromagnetic and ferroelectric, we called multi-ferroic. So they have multiple kinds of ferroic things, things going on. And these really had um, magnetic dipoles and electric dipoles both together. So the way that we did this was first kind of theoretically. We solved the equations of, of quantum mechanics that describe how electrons in solids behave and predicted what kinds of atoms we should choose and how we should arrange them in order to get multiferroic behavior. Then we went to the computer and programmed these equations into the computer and checked that in the computer it be they behaved how we expected. And then we went to the laboratory and actually made the materials. And we did this in two ways. One was that we just combined the kinds of atoms that are good at ferroelectricity with the kind of atoms that are good for ferromagnetism. We found ways of combining them in the same material. And our prototype material that, that we made with this method by taking unusual kinds of chemistry is called bismuth iron oxide or bismuth ferrite. And our other approach was to take atoms that are not usually ferroelectric and arrange them in unusual crystal structures. So kind of trick them to being stacked in unusual ways in, in solids. And here our prototype is a material called yttrium manganite, yttrium manganese oxide. Those of you who are experts can see that there's a bit of an unusual structure in that it has layers of manganese and oxygen separated by layers of, of yttrium. And this is rather um, unconventional. And this kind of layering kind of allowed us to trick it into being ferroelectric. So the way that we make these materials is also not, not rocket science. So we basically cook them in very sophisticated ovens this is our oven. It goes up to a couple of thousand of degrees, so it would really burn your lunch. It wouldn't be so good. And we very slowly melt the atoms in a very intense light beam. And we kind of rotate while we're doing it to, get, um, to make the atoms very smooth and evenly arranged. And we do this very slowly. And we're able to make beautiful little crystals. So this is half a centimeter. This is actually a crystal of that yttrium manganite that I just showed you. And with this process, we're able to really arrange the atoms exactly where we'd like them to be. So here's a, a, 
image taken using a very powerful microscope. This is now five nanometers. So this is a million times smaller than this. And these white dots here are individual atoms. This is now actually the bismuth iron oxide compound I showed you, and the white dots are the bismuth atoms. And you can see that they're absolutely perfectly arranged. So again, the level of control that's possible these days with, um, in making materials was really um, helpful to us in being able to develop this entirely new class of materials. Okay, so this is very, if you're, if you're a theoretical material scientist, well, this is very exciting because we've made something that, that was new and was unexpected. But if you're not a theoretical material scientist, you should also be very excited about this. And let me, let me tell, you, tell you why you should be excited also. So magnetic materials, ferromagnetic materials with their magnetic dipoles, with their north and south poles, are also very widely used in modern technologies. And magnetic materials, they're very kind of complementary to silicon materials. So where silicon is used for processing information in microelectronic devices, magnetic materials are used for storing it. And they do this in the orientation of these magnetic dipoles. So north up, south down, or, or south up, north down which represent the ones and zeros of digital electronics. So this is how your information is stored. Your, those of you writing your thesis, your thesis is stored in these kind of magnetic data bits. Here's a, here's a picture um, taken with a, a magnetic microscope of these white and black regions represent these opposite orientations of the um, magnetic data bits, the ones and zeros of digital electronics in a now kind of old computer hard drive. And magnetic materials are very good at this because these magnetic data bits, these little dipoles, they can be very small, they can be very stable, and they're quite easy to detect. But they come with a, with a cost, which is that in order to control the magnetism, we need to use a magnetic field. And to make a magnetic field, we need a coil of wire, and we have to run an electric current through it. And the component that we need to do this has to be quite large, and it has to be quite heavy, and it uses a lot of energy. Running the electric current through the, uh, running the, electric current through the coil of wire heats everything up, and we lose a lot of energy to heat. And so this is not a very efficient, uh, efficient um, process. Maybe you once um, injured your knee and went to the hospital for an MRI, and you remember you were in this enormous machine. Most of that machine was generating the magnetic field, actually. So um, generating magnetic fields is not, not very easy. But now imagine, in our, in our, so magnetism is generally controlled by magnetic fields, but in our multiferroics, we have both the magnetic dipole and the electric dipole. And so our plan or our hope was that in a multiferroic, we'd have all the advantages of magnetism so we could continue to do all of the existing technologies, that we, mag magnetism-based existing technologies, but now we should be able to control them with an electric field. So this is our vision then for a new um, data storage device. The ones and zeros are still represented by the orientation of the magnetic dipoles, but now we can come and detect and control these using an electric field. And compared with a magnetic field, the component that we need to generate an electric field can be really tiny and compact, and it uses a vanishingly small amount of energy. So this was from the, from the start. I have to confess, my interest in multiferroics is really in the basic physics, but we had this excuse, or our technology driver was that you know, maybe we could revolutionize storage technologies by having electric field control of magnetism, by the fact we combined the ferromagnetic properties with the ferroelectric properties, and they, and they coupled with each other. Okay, so I'm, I want to show you some data, because this you know, cartoon looks all very nice, and I want to show you actually the, the first data from when we tried to do this, when we tried with an electric field to control the magnetism. A little bit to show you that in real life, it's all a whole lot more messy, actually. Um, but yeah, let me, let me show you if we can control the magnetism with electric fields. So this, this was the very first, um, I'd say, demonstration that we could really do this, and this was done in collaboration with my long-term collaborator, Ramesh, at UC Berkeley. So what I'm showing you here is a, a picture of the surface of one of our multiferroic materials, one that I mentioned earlier, this bismuth iron oxide, bismuth ferrite. And at the top, I'm showing you a, a, a picture of the surface 
take, measured using a technique called piezo force microscopy, which measures the ferroelectric domains, and what I mean by that is the orientation of the electric dipoles. So here the black and white regions represent opposite orientations of the electric dipoles. So previously I showed you these as little rectangles, in real life they're a bit messier than that, but still they're all either pointing up or pointing down, they're either black or white. And then in the bottom part of this picture, I'm showing you, I hope you can see, see the bottom part, the same area, this time imaged using a technique called photoemission electron microscopy, and this measures the magnetic dipoles. So in the top, we have a measurement of the electric dipoles, and in the bottom, we have a measurement of the magnetic dipoles. And this is just after we made the material and, and, and took it out of the oven, and this is just how it looked. Well, we cleaned the top a bit first. So the first thing to notice, or the main thing to notice from these two pictures, is these patterns are very, very similar. So maybe if you see this kind of tuning fork um, picture here, this white with a little black in the middle, and you look down here, you see it again, right? This tuning fork, or um, this pattern over here, and it looks a bit like a spear. Here's the spear on this side. And you can continue and, and, and match this little box here and this little box down here. These are basically the same patterns. So this was the first very exciting feature that we noticed about this material, was that the electric dipoles and the magnetic dipoles were coupled. When we had the electric dipoles in one direction, we also had the magnetic dipoles. And, and then, when we, when opposite, then when they were opposite, the others were opposite too. So this was a good start. If we want to be able to control magnetism with electric fields, we want the electric and magnetic dipoles to talk to each other. What I'm going to show you next is what happened when we apply an electric field. So that when this before or after switching, this means we then applied an electric field. And when we apply an electric field, we change the pattern of electric dipoles. This is what the, what the electric field does. And so now we have a completely different pattern of the electric dipoles. This was, as I mentioned, was the very first data. Now things are a little bit more systematic at this stage. All we could do was change. We couldn't control how we changed, but we, we, made it, we made it change. So let's see then what happens to the magnetic dipoles when I change the electric dipoles. And here you see that the magnetic dipoles have followed exactly the change in the electric dipoles. So here this kind of pointy thing here is, 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 is down here. So we really had um, electric field control of magnetism, exactly what we were, we were looking for, which was very, very exciting. We jumped up and down, got very excited. Oh, here's, for example, one little spot started off white and ended up black, and here, down here, started off black and ended up white. So the, the regions are really switching. Um, yeah, we were excited. We persuaded other people to be excited too. Science Magazine described it as a, as a breakthrough, breakthrough of the year. This was in 2007. Um, Physicists used electric fields to manipulate the magnetic domains in a multi um, I'm showing you this because to make the point that this was now a little bit over 10 years ago, and just in the last months, I'd say, we have really the first prototype devices from Intel. I think there are many, um, many device companies who are starting to think, what will we do when silicon runs out, when we have to do something different? And, and multi is one of the directions that they're exploring. And it's really um, 10 years from the first demonstration in the laboratory to a first prototype device. This is not in any of your computers. This is at the stage of being a, a paper that just got published in, in, in science. So all of the difficulties associated from taking those messy pictures I just showed you and making it into something really deterministic were about a ten, a 10 years. And so it's, it's not going to be tomorrow that you have multi in all in all of your devices. So we were very, yeah, we were very, very excited. I want to show, give you kind of one more example of where multi might really re revolutionize technologies. And, and I, I, I chose this second example as a little bit of an excuse because I wanted to show you this picture. Um, so when I first saw this picture, I noticed that the artists just <laughs> also looked interested in it about this one as well. I don't know, it was like... Um, when I, first heard, when I heard my first late Beethoven string quartet, it was like, whoa, not only was it, it's just astonishingly beautiful, right? It's really striking, this image. I'll tell you what it is in a moment. But, but it also came com scientifically completely out of nowhere. I ne never would have, if I'd had to make a prediction, predicted this kind of behavior. So what this is, is a pattern of the electric dipoles 
in the other multiferroic that I first showed you, the yttrium, yttrium manganite. Um, so the black and white regions are again um, regions of opposite orientations of the electric dipole, but in this picture they're actually pointing up and down in, in, the, in the plane of the, of the page. So maybe black would be pointing up and white would be, would be pointing down. And again this, this picture is taken um, with the same technique as, as we looked at earlier, it's called piezo force, um, piezo force microscopy. So this is, a, this is very unusual, it's an extremely unusual um, pattern of electric dipoles. Usually ferroelectrics don't, don't look like this. Conventional non multiferroic ferroelectrics, I'd never seen anything like this before until, until we kind of, my colleague Manfred Fiebe kind of just chanced upon, upon this, this picture. And what's particularly interesting about it is if you say, let's look at this, this region here, and remember I said that the white here is electric dipole pointing up and the black would be electric dipole pointing down. So here's kind of a cartoon, the electric dipole's pointing up and the electric dipole's pointing down with a kind of interface in the middle where they're pointing directly at each other. And this is extremely an unhappy situation for a material to be in. It's kind of like if you had two bar magnets and you try to take the, both the north poles and push them together, remember they, they break apart. So electric dipoles do the same thing. If you try to push two electric dipoles together with the same charges pointing towards each other, they, th this material would basically explode if we just left it like this, like the picture on the, on the right. So what does it do? I mean, clearly it hasn't exploded, right? It sat here in the microscope long enough for us to take this, this beautiful image. And so somehow the material found a way to point its charges directly at each other and not, not be too unhappy about it. And what it did actually was it took extra charge and put it at these interfaces. And so when we measure with a technique that measures the amount of electric current at these interfaces, these arrows are indicating the direction of the dipoles, what we find are very, very narrow regions, these are really just a few couple of atoms thick, where we have electric current. So we have regions where we can, that, are, that are as thin as is possible, the size of an, of an individual layer of atoms, where we have electric current, and, and regions where we don't have electric current, and we can move these regions around with electric field. So this is a, an entirely new kind of behavior that we had not expected. It really we kind of was serendipity that led us to discover this. But now we can start to think, okay, how could we make a device that exploits that? Can we use this now to process information? Can we use it to store information? And, um, and really this could, could generate entirely new types of, of device design. It's not just a kind of modification of existing the transistor behavior, but this could allow us to do something entirely different. So our new multiferroics, I've given you a couple of examples of how they might entirely transform the ways that we design microelectronic devices and lead to entirely new types of information technologies. So I kind of leave it up to you to think about whether we're about to enter a new multiferroics age. I don't want to give you the impression that um, everything we do in materials research is based on um, designing new devices. So I want to, and I wanted another excuse to show you, the, to show you this beautiful picture. So I want to tell you about um, a kind of research direction that's absolutely not going to have any impact in anything useful, I'd say. Um, and I want, to, I want to tell you about this really in, in part because it's, 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 it's very, very fun. But also I want to kind of make a, a little bit of a, maybe a political point that one needs, in science, one needs fundamental science research that isn't useful. So uncovering, understanding why a material, why the atoms and electrons in a solid arrange themselves like this, discovering it and then explaining it, I would argue is as valuable as, or as exciting, for me it was as exciting as finding a new elementary particle in CERN. And this picture I'd say is as beautiful as listening to the Philharmonic play a Brahms symphony. These are all activities that as a society, as a civilized society, we think are, are worthwhile to invest in. And with materials research, I'd say there's even a, another, an additional argument for, for fundamental research. Materials research sits really at the, at the intersection between science and engineering. And so a lot of the time we're thinking, okay, I, 
I want to develop a material for a particular application. I want to make a device better. I want to make a building stronger. I want to um, do something. Um, and I have already the application in mind. And this is, of course, very important. But when, I, when we work on problems where we already have the application in mind, then, of course, we, we're working only on things that we've already been able to imagine. And so we're going kind of down a, a pathway that's, that's already set, and it's not going to take us in any really new directions. And so we need also this flexibility to, to explore in a kind of, not unstructured, but an undirected um, research, unrestricted research, in order to really make entirely new discoveries. Certainly when we first started working on multiferroics, I remember I had a, a colleague um, call me up and say, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm organizing a workshop on impossible materials and I'd like you to come. There was no device physicists waiting for a magnetic material they could control with an electric field because that kind of device hadn't been thought of yet. Hadn't, the materials didn't exist and no one had envisaged. So in a, in a sense, sometimes we just need to play a little bit and, and, and to come across really new, new things. Okay, back to the point, um, I, the, the useless um, research. Uh, I'll show you actually the useless research now. I've given you my manifesto for why we should um, conduct useless research. Um, so these, um, if you look closely at this pattern, you'll see that always I have up and down electric dipoles meeting at points. Actually, I always have six of them meeting at points. And remember, this is a surface, so this is a cross section. And so these points on the surface in three dimensions are actually lines. Okay, these go, go into the surface. And so let me show you a kind of a model. We have not been, I should to be completely honest, we have not been able to measure these lines except by imaging the surface, then having the poor student kind of polish the surface for like a few days, <laughs> get rid of a few layers of atoms and image it again. And after you know, a month or two of doing this, we can, we can map how those intersections evolve into the material, but we don't have a direct non-destructive way of imaging them. We would really love to have that, but we don't. But this is a, a simulation. Um, so here's the surface with the, with the black and white pattern. And then these intersection points, we're pretty sure in the material wind in and out like lines. Sometimes they go all the way through and out the other side, sometimes they kind of wrap around themselves. But they're these lines, they look like strings. What I'm gonna show you next is a, again a computer simulation. And this was um, done by my colleague Martin Kunz at the University of Geneva. And you can see that the thing, he, the result of his computer simulation was really basically identical to ours, right? He also has these kind of strings going through the material. He didn't, though, simulate the electric dipoles in the multiferroic. What Martin simulated was the behavior of the early universe 10 to the minus 37 seconds after the Big Bang. So he, he simulated a proposed behavior in the early universe when the universe expanded really quickly, and it's proposed that it changed its structure and formed what are called cosmic strings. So when Martin showed me this, I got extremely excited. I'm like, we've got cosmic strings in our laboratory. We have really the same, exactly the same behavior. Um, yeah, so this is the multiferroic simulation. This is the early universe simulation. And maybe we could, could do something with that. And so what we were able to, to show when we, when we looked in detail at actually what, what, we, the pro, what the process was that each of us were describing, what we saw was that our multiferroic material and the early universe both underwent what's called a symmetry-lowering phase transition. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you what that is in just a second. And it was this symmetry-lowering phase transition that generated these lines which are actually defects. They're regions where the system's not perfect. If a perfect material would be all black or all white, and these defects are the points where the black and white meet each other. So let me show you what this um, symmetry-lowering phase transition business is. Actually, you know already, but it's just a bit of a, a technical, technical term. So a symmetry-lowering phase transition is something like when we go from water to ice. So in water, when, our, when it, it, it's hot, the water molecules are all jiggling about and below some temperature, which is the freezing temperature at zero degrees, the 
molecules all line up and it's cold and I, and I make ice. And it's maybe not so obvious. I, this is something that can confuse me for a long time. It kind of looks like this is a symmetry lowering phase transition. This is high symmetry and this is low symmetry. And it, this is a bit bothersome because when you just look at this, you think, well, that's more symmetrical. But what physicists mean by low symmetry is here, if I sit on this molecule and I look up, I see something different. I see this kind of downward pointing molecule. Whereas if I sit on this molecule I look, and I look to the right, I see a kind of upwards pointing molecule. And this to a physicist is low symmetry. I see something different when I look up than when I look to the side. In the liquid water, wherever I look, I see the same thing. I see a mess. And so this is called high, high symmetry. So, yeah, symmetry lowering. So high symmetry, if everything's jiggling about, it's just jiggling about in every direction. So, so this is, yeah, you have to just, yeah. I don't know, work with me on this one. This is how it is. <laughs> High symmetry, everything's jiggling about. It's jiggling about up, it's jiggling about left. So it's the same up and to the left. Here, I see something different when I look up than when I see to the left. I see something definitely pointing in a different direction than I see over here. So this is low symmetry. The early universe does something similar to this. It starts off as high symmetry, or it's proposed to do something like this. It starts off as high symmetry, it ends up as low symmetry. And my multiferroic does this also. The other thing you know about symmetry lowering phase transitions is they form defects. So here in the water to ice example again, this is actually the Stockholm archipelago. Here's the water, the high symmetry state, and here's the ice that's formed in its low symmetry state. And as we go further and further into the winter, then these patches of ice join together. And I don't know if you can see this very well. Here's ice with, say, a patch of ice with the crystals lined up in this direction, a patch of ice with the crystals lined up in this direction. And in between, they form defects. They form the, 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 the point where the ice joins together. It's not perfect anymore. This I really liked. These, the ducks somehow knew about the defects, right? The ducks sit in the middle of the ice crystals and they avoid these defects, which is pretty smart of them because probably the ice is weaker at the defects. So symmetry lowering phase transitions and the fact that they form these defects, in this case the defect is like um, kind of a, a, a surface rather than a line, but the overall physics is, is rather similar. So this is something we're quite familiar with. And it's not so different. In my yttrium manganite, my atoms are arranged in this high symmetry state at high temperature and they kind of collapse a bit at low temperature and form a low symmetry state and generate these strings. The early universe is, is, is really a difficult, it's harder to, it's really harder to, um, to visualize, I think. It's proposed that straight after the Big Bang, the vacuum, there was nothing there and it was very high symmetry. And then after this very short amount of time, 10 to the minus 37 seconds, there was a symmetry lowering phase transition, but it made these strings. So this part is, I, I, don't, I can't give you a good picture for. Mathematically, we worked, went and worked out really the, the um, mathematics, the, the, what's called the potential energy for this process, and it looks like this. This is actually a calculation, not a cartoon. And mathematically, the potential energy for this process looks like this. And so we have a very similar behavior. We have this kind of circular symmetry associated with these two behaviors. So, of course, studying for cosmologists, studying this cosmic string formation is really, really hard. Ideally, you'd like to go and replay the Big Bang in the laboratory, wait 10 to the minus 37 seconds and measure. And all of those processes are really difficult. You'd probably never get the ethics board to approve <laughs> Big Bang replaying in the in laboratory. You can't make cosmic strings. They're really energetic. So even at CERN in the largest hadronic colliders, these are far too wimpy to make a, a, a cosmic string. You can sit and watch and observe and hope that a cosmic string will wander into, into your field of view. So this is the, um, a, the, a measurement of what's called the cosmic microwave background. It's the relic radiation left over from the Big Bang taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And this has been analyzed and, and cosmic strings have not been seen yet, but it's known, at least there's an upper limit on how many there can be in the world. Or you can simulate. But now we have this extra option with our multiferroics which is that we can go into the laboratory and use our material, our multiferroic material, and measure the process of cosmic string formation. So we, we, in the laboratory, we go and do the experiments that our cosmology friends would like to do on the early universe. 
Do cosmic strings exist? Well, we've seen that they do. We've, I've just showed you a picture of them. Did they form as we think? We can really test um, the process of their formation. How do they evolve when they sit on the lab bench for a couple of months? Do, what happens to them? And what are their properties? We can measure all of these things. So let me just show you one thing. So, um, our cosmology friends said what they'd really like to know is if the universe expanded at different rates, they have very well-defined predictions for how many different numbers of cosmic strings would form in those cases. So we said, we can do that. We can just cool our multiferroic at different rates and measure. And these pictures, you can see the scale bar down here. This is the same scale. It's not that I took this one and, and, and blew it up. These are... Um, Measurements of cooling our multiferroic through that symmetry lowering phase transition at different rates. And you can see that we get really different numbers of our cosmic string analogs forming. And so one can have a, an undergraduate researcher sit and count how many um, of these cosmic strings there are in each of these cases. That is a pretty cool, I would have loved to do that as an undergraduate, but it was a really fun project. And we can really test, um, test the predictions of cosmologists. What we find is sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. Or sometimes our material behaves as the cosmologists think the early universe does, and sometimes it doesn't, which is, of course, really exciting for us because it means we have, we have more to do. There was a lovely article in The Economist um, on, this, they called it Tabletop Astrophysics. And I love this quote from Cliff Burgess at the Perimeter Institute in Ontario. He's not sure whether our experiments reveal any cosmic truth, um, but they're nevertheless worth pursuing, he said, like tap dancing snakes. The point is not that we do it well, but that we do it at all. So I, I kind of like, <laughs> I like the idea. Yeah. But the, the point that I wanted to make with this is that we actually are learning a lot of material science, maybe some basic physics of cosmology, um, by doing these experiments, and they're really not pushing the frontiers of the multiferroics age. So one should also do non-useful research, or non-applied research. So this is my last, last slide. I'm a little bit over. I think I was told to do 45 minutes. So. Um, and what I want, to, I want to make an extra point with this last slide, which is, I don't know if, if there are other journalists in the audience. One has to be very careful how one talks to journalists. Um, <laughs> because this was an extremely flattering um, article in the National Geographic about our multiferroics kind of cosmology um, um, crossover projects, where they said the universe's existence may be explained by the new material. This was our new multiferroic material. And this, of course, is very nice, but I think it was really overstating our contribution. Um, and particularly, a new material could help physicists explain the existence of matter, such as this astronaut seen above, above the Earth, which was really, lo really lovely. Um, so I'm showing you this, of course, a little bit because it's funny, but, um, but also kind of to illustrate, well, to, to make the point also, it's, it's a little bit about, of what we do, trying to explain in, in some cases, or in my case, just one, one tiny little, little corner of the universe, but that's what, what I, spend, I spend my time doing, and I, and I try to explain it using, using my new material. So maybe it's not, not so far-fetched. So thank you very much for listening and um, for your interest and your engagement on, a, on an evening where I can't imagine that you don't have better things to do than listen to me talk about <laughs> multiferroic materials. It's really a pleasure to be here and I'd be happy to take any questions or any comments either now or over a cocktail later at the bar. <laughs>